Okay, well, welcome everybody. Um, there's a new uh, set of questions uh, for us here today. Um, and very interesting ones, I should say. So, uh, there are a few questions from Sandra. And I think we should just get started straight away. Uh, this is regarding the gatekeepers or the guardians at the threshold. Uh, this is in relation to the question we had last week where we were talking about varying levels of awareness and also becoming part of an egregore. Um, so the question is the one who lets people to a next level of existence. How does he or she evaluate a person? Is this by his or her deeds, qualities and aims? or else before he decides to let the person into the next level of existence with one life, within one life or before incarnation. Uh, I think it's a very good question and there are actually uh, different sets of answers from it according to different spiritual traditions. Uh, so in a way the most open of spiritual traditions when it comes to guardians of the threshold is Buddhism. Uh, Buddhism basically states that we are our own guardians, we are our own limitation when it comes to rising to higher levels of awareness. Um, this is uh, described in the, in the Bardo tradition, but in Buddhism you have basically two traditions, the uh, Tantric tradition and the Bardo tradition. And the Tantric tradition really focuses a lot on, um, in a way, um, how to develop yourself during your life, how to really develop your energetic senses and uh, um, um, to grow there. And the Bardo tradition is more how you act in a place in between, what happens if you're not incarnated. And in the Bardo tradition it is also described how we have various tendencies and because we have these tendencies, this karma, uh, that we end up in one incarnation or another and these can be incarnations in a body, or, but also move into different levels of awareness. And it basically states that it is our own desire, our own identification, our lack of wisdom, our lack of knowledge, uh, which yeah, in a way leads us astray. So even though we, we may want to go up, and we may think we're going up, but because of our own illusions, we end up in other places. Um, so, for an example, um, there is a, a, a unfulfillable desires. Um, so often everybody wants to be happy. And um, uh, some people are able to just be content with what they have. It is like, okay, I may be poor, I don't have enough to eat, but I'm happy enough and, and I'm okay. But other people have a desire which can never be quenched. Like if they want a, a bigger car and they get a bigger car and when they have a bigger car they want a bigger house and when they get the bigger house they want a bigger garden. and So it doesn't matter how much you give them because always there will be this dissatisfaction, this hunger. And uh, if we have this tendency, this habit to be hungry, to always want more, uh, then we limit ourselves. Uh, to incarnations where it is possible to really collect and gather things and to try to hold on to them. And the higher levels of awareness are inaccessible for a person who is, in a way, hampered by greed. And we see this also reflected in the Christian tradition, where uh, they talk about the seven deadly sins. And these are also exactly uh, the same. So there are sins, things which block us in our spiritual growth, in our contact with the Absolute, uh, because they can only be, be fulfilled, uh, these sins, by having a very low incarnation. So if we want to be lustful, we need a body to feel that lust. And the same if we want to be angry and destroy something, well, it's not necessary per, to have a body, but even if you go into an energetic incarnation, it will be a very low vibration you'll be in, because the low vibrations give you the power and the strength to destroy your opponents. But they also limit your, uh, your awareness. Um, so it is basically by our, our sins that we are 
uh, de defined. And of course every sin has an opposite, has a virtue. And by developing our virtues we yeah, are able to rise higher. It's kind of like a compensation mechanism. Um, if you look more towards the, the uh, spiritist traditions, um, they talk a lot about uh, uh, guardians, and these guardians are basically um, uh, a reaction to our own fears. Um, so what they describe, if you leave your, your body and you start traveling in your astral body and you try to reach uh, yeah, higher levels of awareness, you want to go towards the Absolute. Um, but here you encounter uh, many challenges. And the challenges are only challenges if you are fearful or lacking in knowledge or lacking in understanding. So, for instance, if you go on a trance journey and you encounter a fearsome tiger which wants to eat you. And if you have fear of death or fear of animals or fear of yeah, just the violence, you'll run away from the tiger and you will stay in your own little safe astral domain. But if you recognize, like, oh, as soon as like my body dies, or even like my astral body dies, then my spirit will keep on existing and it will just reform a body, and only the lower body will be destroyed and the higher body will remain. And it is actually a liberation. And you let the tiger eat you and devour you, you will find out that you still exist, but your heavier body will have been removed by the tiger. So it's actually on one hand the guardian, but on the other hand it is also um, uh, a guard who helps you to pass on to a higher level by removing your heavier energies, by removing your, your, your lower vibrations. Um, if you look more towards very specific uh, um, things you want to uh, get into, so an egregore or a contact with a, with a deity, um, they are rather more specific, so they really look at the, uh, at the path you are walking. And they are not so much interested in what is your level of understanding or what is your level of power, but much more in what are your ideals. And if you try to do the same things as their deity does, or you are a very good student of the domain of their deity, then they tend to accept you. So, for instance, if there is a deity of love, it doesn't matter if you're still in a stage of selfish love or lust, or you're already in a very high stage of uh, more universal love or divine love. Uh, as long as you consider love to be uh, of essential value and to be your guide and the guiding force in your life, um, yeah, the guardians of uh, such a deity's domain or such an egregore will, will accept you because they consider you to be a brother who's on the same road, on the same path towards spiritual development. But, of course, depending on your level of understanding, so the highness of your vibrations, you will be allowed to go into higher or lower segments of that, uh, of that egregore or of that uh, priesthood. Um, it is usually very depending also on which cosmos you're traveling in, what are the, the distinguishing characteristics which determine if you're high or low within that cosmos. So if you look at the Arimanic cosmos, um, it is very much about your, uh, your power of control, your ability to, uh, to control others, to manipulate others, which is considered uh, very important. Um, so it is very much uh, a cosmos of leadership, and if you have these leadership qualities, you are able to yeah to rec to be recognized, and you will be seen as a leader, as a king, as a captain, as a general, or as a low foot soldier who should remain in the lower regions. If you look at the uh, Luciferical cosmos, it is very much about uh, development. So it is uh, much more about the amount of knowledge or the amount of energies or the amount of power you have. Um, so it is not so much determined by skill as is in the, in the Arimanic cosmos, but more by the quantity. Um, 
with of the, the energies you have managed to amass. Um, and also the ability to protect yourself because if you amass a lot of energies but they can be taken from you easily and this is often a test which will happen in the uh, luciferical cosmos something will yeah, try to ascertain how much of the knowledge is actually integrated in you which is a true realization or is it just book knowledge or something you've heard and it is only your true knowledge what you've really made a part of you which will determine the level of, uh, of awareness to which you are able to rise. Um, if you look at the nature cosmos, um, it is very much about the ability to, to stretch your awareness. So if the ability to feel what others are feeling, to feel um, the energy around you of, or of a group or of a nation, um, so it is uh, basically determined by how large uh, a thing can you still successfully identify with. So we can of course attune to the Absolute, but none of us can has the awareness to comprehend the Absolute. We barely have the awareness to comprehend ourselves. But by stretching this awareness and also experimenting with trying to identify and to connect with different life forms, um, your awareness of the whole becomes bigger. And this is generally how your level of awareness is measured in, uh, in that cosmos. And finally, if we look at the, um, the uh, yeah, divine cosmos, it is more determined by uh, what level of being you can be inspired with directly. Uh, I don't know if I explained this already, but otherwise I'll just reiterate. Um, the level, the knowledge we receive on higher levels becomes more and more and more whole, so there is less dualism and also the vibration becomes higher. But um, uh, the higher vibrations, they tend also to disturb um, the lower vibrations. Um, so in a way an angel is very pure, it's a very pure being and a god is also a very pure being because they consist of these very high vibrations which actually remove and burn up all the lower vibrations so they cannot be sinful, they cannot be petty or um, um, have these identifications with the body that they believe they're just a, a physical body or just matter but also these lower identifications they burn up if you are in contact with such a higher being and the chances are that you go insane because you can no longer be yourself in the presence of such a being for a long time and this actually generates also scarring on the energetic body if the energy you're contacting is too high so in a way for your own protection um, either the contact is kept very brief with the higher beings or uh, they try to go down as much as possible in their vibration before they contact you so not as to disturb your energy body too much um, so this is basically how your uh, your level of existence is uh, is gauged and we have um, a natural level of existence and um, on which our awareness actually feels most at home but uh, we are all here in a body, but that doesn't mean that necessarily everything in the body has the existence which is only material. Most of us have, a, have an, an existence which is at least astral, so we are at least aware that we are spirits which can move from body to body. And some of us have an awareness where we can really be aware of our, the journey of our soul, that we are actually spirits who are on a journey or belong to a group and are traveling in this way and some people even manage to have an, an awareness of the powers themselves so this is the formless cosmos in which the, the gods and the goddesses and the planetary powers exist um, but these types of awareness translate very poorly to our physical lives uh, so these people often end up very confused or insane um, and uh, yeah, one level beyond the awareness of the of the gods and all the powers is the level of um, enlightenment. And one of the tricky things is that um, 
by uh, focusing us uh, or by doing performing rituals uh, we can really boost our awareness we can push ourselves upward so if I spend I don't know a month in a monastery and I am all the time meditating it is possible to reach a state of awareness um, and uh, but I can only maintain this high level of consciousness in ideal conditions so as soon as I leave the monastery and I eat a hamburger and I see a pretty woman then I lose my awareness and it goes down to a much lower level again and um, a lot of spiritual practices actually focus on temporarily raising the awareness and drugs, uh, psychoactive drugs do the same, they create a temporary raising of the awareness by adding energy by creating optimal conditions but ultimately you're in a way going to a level you have not really evolved to so you will always fall down or be afraid of falling down and or need to work con constantly to maintain yourself on that level and this is not a very useful way um, because we are on a certain level and the lessons we receive are on that level and if you push yourself to a higher level of awareness um, you're actually spending all your time all your effort on maintaining yeah, yourself there and you actually hold your spiritual progress so it is not a healthy thing to try to progress too quickly it is useful in a way to scout ahead so you push yourself ahead so you have the experience of what it will be like to be there and then you have to find out like how to get there by yourself in a natural way by just progressing your your consciousness but by in a way pushing yourself upward and falling down again you also learn what are the powers within me what are the lower energies within me which pull me down in awareness and so this can be a very useful way to uh, uh, to learn your weaknesses and also the contact with these guardians uh, can also be very useful um, often a guardian will pose kind of a, a riddle to you and there's no right or wrong answer uh, it is just determining uh, where you are or where you need to go so for instance if I'm going up in awareness and the lower yeah, levels of, of this world they're muddled they're a mix of all different cosmoses together and I start to go up and I meet a guardian and the guardian will pose me for a choice so I will have a dream for instance in which um, yeah there is a, a sudden danger and who do I save do I save myself uh, do I save my my partner or do I save my pet <laughs> and by making this, these choices um, or do you sacrifice yourself hoping to save all so there is no right or wrong choice in this but you end up in a different place depending on what you choose so if you sacrifice yourself yeah this can be a sign of leadership so you can get into a very nice arimanic cosmos or uh, yeah, if you uh, yeah, for instance sacrifice somebody else and say like okay you have to die so I can live okay well this is also fine but you end up in a different part of the cosmos so the, the, the guardians are not just there to, uh, to filter but also to direct you to uh, where you are going and to, in a way these questions are to determine your nature and these questions are also very good to, to look at them yourself because they tell you like am I going towards the light cosmos or the dark cosmos am I in the warm stream or in the cold stream um, and do I belong more to the yeah to the divine or to the nature, to the Luciferic or to the harmonic flow? And also the uh, egregores, they will also have very similar tests. Um, if you, for instance, try to make contact with uh, with something very specific like a saint, um, the saint will often also ask you to reveal yourself, um, so that yeah in a way um, it's a sign of trust and humility to remove all your defenses to show yourself with all your good sides and all your bad sides in a way are you willing to be judged you have to have a certain humility towards these higher powers and really to be in a way spiritually naked before them uh, and um, 
if you're willing to really open up to give yourself to, to trust the higher um, then this process of judging can uh, can take place and then the, the saint will usually determine like are you uh, on the same path or do you have problems which yeah, are really in their domain if so they can offer you a blessing if not then it doesn't mean that you're unworthy it can just mean that this saint is yeah, in a very different flow and doesn't feel like it's it is the correct power to help you at that present time. So, well, that was a long answer. Um, are there any more questions about what I just spoke about, the guardians at the threshold? Oh, I'll just say one more thing. So, one, there are various stages uh, which of death or things you need to leave behind. And the first thing is basically you need to leave behind your fear of death. Because if you stay identified with the body and the fears of the body, uh, your consciousness is unable to rise. Uh, so you have to be willing to leave your body behind. And the next step is to be willing to leave all your knowledge and your thoughts behind. Because knowledge and thoughts, they only exist on very low levels of awareness where we have our own limited faulty logic and categories of thinking and on higher levels of awareness they will not serve you. Um, and once you've left all your knowledge and your in way, identification with your thoughts behind, you will have to leave behind your personality. Uh, because your personality limits you to your current incarnation and in a way blocks you from being aware of, um, yeah, of your previous incarnations or really the nature of your spirit, which is changes over incarnations. So once you leave behind also your personality, you have to leave behind your identification with, with the form. So if you stop of thinking of yourself as belonging to the earth or belonging to the human race, um, then you can really enter the domains of, uh, of form, of shape. And in these domains, um, you can really make contact with the essential powers, war, love, peace, knowledge itself, um, growth, stagnation, chaos, order. And you start to enter into the formless cosmos. And um, you need to leave behind all desire for power and control and all these identifications to reach enlightenment. And if you've reached enlightenment, you're still um, bound by your own intentions. Uh, so you have to leave behind all your intentions, all your desires, and in a way allow yourself to be moved only by your own will, and no longer by your karma or your, your tendencies. Um, and next is actually to release your own will itself, so that you are no longer in a way dominated by your own will, but you're really able to surrender to the higher will, to the inspiration of the angels, and ultimately to the inspiration of the Absolute itself, or the Archangels. Um, so that's what I wanted to say. And are there any questions regarding um, the guardians at the threshold? Uh, okay, I see one question here. So lucid dreaming will help you with this, and this is indeed um, very true. Lucid dreaming is actually the first step towards um, yeah, towards journeying outside of the body. Um, if you look at the uh, at the astral, the closest parts of the astral are actually the parts of the astral which are bound to our own self. So this is your personal astral domain. And your emotions and your thoughts, they exist in the astral world, in this personal domain. But also your dreams uh, exist in this domain. So what you see if you start dreaming, then the first layer, the lowest level of dream you will encounter, you will actually encounter your own emotions and your own thoughts. So the things you've done just before you went to sleep, you will dream about them. And this is the lowest level of the dream. And if you go a little bit further in the dream, uh, you go towards deeper associations 
um, so you're able to talk to different parts of yourself. So they often these other fragments of yourself, of your subconscious, will often show themselves as persons you know, or animals you know, or places you know. But you're still, in a way, yeah, talking with yourself, discovering yourself, harmonizing yourself in this dream. Um, the next level of dream is actually the, a creative dream where you start creating things and you uh, create your own adventure, your own story, you start to create fantastical creatures. And it's actually from this level of the dream that we're very close to stepping outside of our own personal domain. Because if we create things and we create shapes and if we in a way invite other powers to move into these shapes we in a way release the control of what we have created another power can take control if i for instance imagine a flying dog um, and i release control over it another spirit can move into the shape of the flying dog which is in my dream and use this shape to communicate with me to or even to take me out of my dream into a larger world, into a collective dream. And often egregores and uh, spiritual schools will have collective dreamscapes. So where the members of the school or members of the egregore can, uh, can go in a way to get lessons and to interact and to learn from other members of this egregore. So then you already have a communal dream space and if you can uh, from this communal dream space, it is a relatively small step to st really start astral traveling and to say like, okay, I don't want to experience this world only in my dreams, but I also want to experience it with my waking consciousness. The big problem in trying to experience something with your waking consciousness is basically your inner critic. Uh, so the inner critic is the part of us which keeps us focused, which keeps us sane in a way. Because there are millions of memories, there are thousands of associations which bubble up in my brain at every moment. And that is basically to our inner critic, which says like, okay, only think one thing at a time, only believe one thing at a time, and uh, use, use your senses and use your logic to determine the truth. So if I'm looking and um, I, I see a dog, then basically all the thoughts of what might I be seeing, am I seeing a moose, am I seeing an elephant, am I seeing a truck, they're pushed away because my critic is saying like, no, the dog is the part which is being confirmed. But if you really want to go into astral travel, you have to be willing to hallucinate, to see things which another part of your brain is telling you are not there or are not real. And there is often a fear for insanity, for losing control, and this blocks us from astral travel. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, yes, that that's. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, that's that's very good. Um, there is some uh, some danger. Uh, generally, not a lot. Um, 
because um, one thing is, is very it's very safe and that is your your soul your core being it is not allowed to be destroyed in this universe so ultimately nothing can happen to you uh, on a larger scale but on a smaller scale various things can happen um, if while you're within your own dream space uh, it is pretty safe you can have lots of strange experiences but ultimately it is your energy and your energy will respond to your own spirit, to your own soul. So anything which happens to you can be undone uh, quite easily. Um, if you go into a collective dream space, um, then you're able to, to lose energy. So energies of you can be stolen or given away and you can accept energies from outside. And these energies can be good for you or they can be bad for you. Um, so it is just like uh, any other food um, uh, or any other interaction with people. Sometimes you lose energy, sometimes you gain energy. And with, with the dream interaction it is, it is the same. Um, if you, um, it is also very good if this happens because it means that actually you're able to really move enough of your energy into your astral body to have these experiences and to grow even while you're sleeping and to transform even while you're sleeping. Um, about going into other bodies, um, it can be a little bit tricky um, because often we have the strongest connection to our own body and always some of our energy remains behind in our own bodies. Uh, a little bit like a magnet so if our spirit gets lost it just looks for like where's my energy and it's like a trail of breadcrumbs and you follow it back and you go end up back at your body and also the energetic body if you go into a dream or into an astral travel and you become afraid the the spirit will return retreat in a way into the physical body where it feels most safe because it is its heaviest vibration and um, so it is okay in the dream to turn into all kinds of creatures and beings um, as long as there is a trail back to your own body. Um, but if you start in a way uh, taking too much energy out of your body, uh, then the body becomes vacant. And just like the, the flying donk you created in your dream, also your physical body can become empty. And if it is unpossessed, if it is vacant, another spirit might so think like, oh gosh, I can go in there and use that body because nobody is using it. And then it will be a case of possession. So it is important to travel, but not really also to exhaust yourself. Um, so it is best to try an astral journey while the, the physical body is, has a strong energy. And uh, if your own energy is weak, if you're like um, uh, in a very bad condition, you're sick, then if you start to astrally travel, either you cannot travel astrally because you don't, you have instincts which are against weakening your body even further because if your spirit goes out of your body, the body has less energy, it will grow more weak. Or if you do force your spirit to leave your body, there won't be enough energy left in the body to maintain it well and then it can easily attract uh, other spirits and these other spirits are not necessarily harmful they might come there to help to maintain the body to keep it alive or even to heal it while you're traveling um, but you have to be very aware of what to do and if you do go very far on an astral journey <coughs> or you want to travel you need to travel while you're sick it is very important to clean the environment where you sleep or where you will, will do the astral traveling so that there are only really friendly spirits there to protect or to maintain your body. Um, one of the things you can do, um, which is actually a lot safer, is to uh, appoint a guardian. So you can ask uh, a saint or an angel or a god or a goddess or uh, a spirit guide or a power animal to um, temporarily watch over your body or even possess your body so nothing else will touch it or harm it. Um, identifying in your dream uh, with another person in itself is not a bad thing. Um, one of the things which are often done by, uh, by spiritual masters 
it's actually that they create various copies of themselves and these copies they sometimes let incarnate into various of their students and then they reintegrate them into themselves and in this way they can experience or really know their students in a very intimate way because they've experienced what it is like to be their student um, but yeah of course these are pretty advanced spiritual practices because if you suddenly have experiences of like I don't know hundreds or dozens of different people mixed up with your own experiences yes it can lead to insanity uh, as well but yeah these are practices which are which are performed and which are done and can be very useful and if it is like a partner or a loved one um, uh, yes this is also relatively normal relatively natural because your love really focuses your energy very strong on the other person and you really want to be one with them and um, by doing this in a dream or energetically melding or there are also tantric exercises for this chakra bonding you can really experience the desires and the feelings of the other person and this is yeah of course a very good learning experience so um, it's, I think it's wonderful that you had this experience just yeah try to prepare so you can do this safely okay any more questions about uh, this topic Okay, um, yes, that it is sometimes hard to go back into the body. Um, this can have two reasons. Um, one of them is the, the karma. So some people, uh, some people's spirits are very uh, eager to grow. So they create a very big list of things to do and things they want to achieve and lessons they want to learn. Um, and as a spirit, of course, you don't suffer. It is just a game for you. But as a human being, a lot of these lessons um, yeah, involve difficulty, involve pain, involve loss. Um, and uh, so there is a natural reluctance of the, the, yeah, of the spirit to get into these uh, yeah, negative vibrations, the heavy vibrations. So often you see with some people who yeah, create a very big, uh, whose spirits have very big expectations of their incarnation, that often the spirit has a problem really going into the body well, because it feels overwhelmed by, the by its own demands. It is asking too much of itself in a way. And this often strives to be um, very strong, very perfect and grow very much, can have a counterproductive effect. Um, what uh, can be done in a, in a, is to try to change a little bit the, uh, the karmic path. Uh, this is something which cannot be done from below, but it can be done from above. So as an incarnated being, I cannot say like, okay, my spirit made a stupid mistake, my life is too difficult, it should be easy. Um, and even the spirit is bound by its, uh, by its intention because it has to, in a way, submit a program like this is what I will do with my life and can I get an incarnation? And uh, ultimately it is the power which grants you the incarnation uh, which has to be willing to change the plan. So you say like, okay, I want a body because I want to learn these things and to do these things. And if suddenly you want to use your body for a very different purpose and you don't want to do these things anymore, you can't do that without losing the right to your body. Um, so you would go to the, to the judges of karma or the powers which 
um, yeah, arrange the reincarnation and distribute the possibilities of incarnation. And depending on which cosmos you are in, or which egregore you are in, or which gods or goddesses grant you this incarnation, these are different powers. But there is always one or several powers which uh, say like, okay, I am guiding you on your path, or you are doing, uh, fulfilling a purpose which is also my purpose. And these are the reasons that we have our incarnations. And by contacting these powers, yeah, we can either get more help in our incarna incarnated lives or some tasks may be changed, may be made lighter so that our spirits can yeah, be in our bodies more easily. Another factor is basically that as we um, get more experience with being outside of our body, we notice that a lot of things are nicer in these higher vibrations. Uh, there's less duality, you're not limited in time and space, um, you don't have to suffer all the limitations of the body, um, you don't have all these illusions uh, as much. Uh, yeah, it's easier to understand things, it's easier to, to alter your circumstances because you have more creative potential and more inspiration if you're not in the body. And so the body is often regarded as a prison, or at least as very frustrating. And the spirit can develop more and more reluctance towards being in the body. And ultimately, yeah, not wishing to be, to be imprisoned anymore. Um, and this is a very difficult problem to solve as well. Um, so some people, they feel that this is so hampering for their earthly existence that they have to stop their spiritual uh, experiences because they are just too tempting and even like after doing one meditation it often takes them days or weeks to come down into the body again. Um, so the, the temptation of the, of the higher world is too big for them. And it is important to realize that it is in a way um, a, a, dual, a dual purpose by going into the body. One is by uh, limiting yourself, you need to develop more skill. If everything is very easy, you don't have to be skillful, it's not a challenge. And by challenging yourself, you grow more quickly. And so one of the reasons the spirit decides to take incarnation is to accelerate its own development. And another reason is the desire to manifest. You may want to change something not just about yourself, but also about the world you're in. Um, you want to experience something and this desire for manifestation, this desire to be effective, to be part of the process of growth, of transformation of the universe, uh, is also a very strong desire for the spirit to enter into the body, to really bring the light, bring the higher awareness to lower levels, to lower vibrations, so that these lower vibrations can be transmuted, transformed, to be more similar to the higher worlds, to the higher vibrations. But this is also a sacrifice, and the sacrifice is never nice, it is not nice to die or to burn or to suffer, but it is a choice we make willingly and consciously. But yeah, once you're in it, you often you want to get out of it. Um, and by, in a way, becoming aware also of the relativity, um, because it is like driving a car, like um, you drive you drive a car, you enjoy it, you love it for a few years, then it gets old and it becomes a hassle to maintain and in the end you yeah, decide like, okay, it's too broken, it's not worth repairing, I take another one. And it's the same way with our bodies. So we drive our body as our spirit and ultimately, yeah, even though we may love our body, yeah, it becomes too decrepit, too old and we need to change it. And by realizing that you are the, the driver and not the car, um, that also helps. So there is, of course, the deficiencies of the car. It might have a dent, it might have scratches, it might have to go long distances over bad roads. But this is the travel, travel of the body and the ego. And uh, of course the car doesn't like it and it suffers and it is harmed. But the spirit can just move on to next and next incarnation. But if you identify with the spirit, also there is less fear. And if you realize that all this fear is actually coming from the ego, from the lower parts of yourself, then you can just 
uh, relativate it, but also you can try to teach the ego, like, okay, you are here, you exist to serve as a vessel for my spirit. And, of course, you want to perpetuate yourself, you want to maintain yourself. And I will help you to do that as best as you can. And this is also your duty to take good care of your car. But ultimately, you're the boss. You decide where the car goes and not the car decides where it goes. So you should not let these fears or limitations uh, limit you. They're basically a lack of inner discipline, an inner disharmony. Okay, I hope that answers your question, Sandra. Uh, time flies and we have lots of questions left. Um, extra knowledge could be a burden that makes understanding difficult. And what do I think of academic education striving for knowledge and exploration? Uh, well, I totally agree because like um, usually most of the knowledge we, we build up tends to um, be lost when we, when we die and take reincarnation. Uh, the part which remains behind is usually left behind as a talent. So it is once you've learned something over a few lifetimes, um, you're born with a talent, so it becomes easier to relearn it in your next lives. Um, but what is important is more that uh, uh, knowledge should lead to awareness. Uh, so knowledge in itself is useless, but if you can... Um, use this knowledge to get certain experiences and these experiences will transform you, will stay with you. So for instance if I read a book and I read about the heavens and the structure of the heavens and the different heavenly planets and worlds and uh, other beings living on those worlds, well this is a nice fantasy and if I die well I may have picked up a skill for reading and my memory may be improved in my next life uh, because I've gone into the habit of reading and remembering things and this habit you take along with you. But if I use this experience and really uh, start to fantasize, I start to be inspired, I try to yeah, imagine what would these other worlds be like, what would these higher experiences be like, even without going there, already I'm preparing myself to journey into these higher worlds. So there's already some experience and feeling of what I have read. So it already becomes a little bit more of a reality to me. On not just a mental level, but also on an emotional level, on an experience level. And yeah, if I can use this knowledge to maybe go on an astral journey or to have prayers to make contact with these powers, then yeah, there is... Yeah, it becomes really functional, it really becomes a transformation of my energy body. And these connections I've made to these higher levels of consciousness or different planets, and these are things which, are, which become part of my spirit and which will go with me to my next incarnation. So in a way, uh, knowledge helps you to be aware, to create a map of the cosmos, but it does not help you to travel the cosmos. And you have to use the map and only by traveling, uh, yeah, we get real benefits. So it is really a, a Gnostic school. It is not just about the, the mental knowledge, it is about experiencing it on all levels. On the physical level, emotional level, on the willpower, with your, your life force body, but also with your more subtle bodies. And trying to integrate it on all levels. Um, because if you do this, then also in your next incarnation, what yeah, knowledge you have, you can easily integrate so that your next incarnation will have this knowledge, will have access to it. And if you yeah, go on a trance journey but you don't incorporate what you've experienced in your daily lives and you yeah, just do it occasionally, like okay, like two times a year I will go on seminar, um, this is not enough to create good in integration and without integration the knowledge is lost if you try to, uh, to incarnate again. Ah, well, this is a beautiful question. Strength comes from a sacrifice, a donation. What would you say to rituals that entail sacrifice? Well, these are definitely the most powerful rituals there are. 
Um, but it is also very important to um, to look exactly at how the sacrifice is made. Um, so let's let's look at the, the simplest uh, sacrifice. So the simplest versions of sacrifice is basically by um, giving some of your attention, your higher awareness, to something else. So the simplest way of, of sacrifice is praying for someone else. So for instance, if I'm uh, going to eat a chicken and I say a prayer like, oh, thank you, dear chicken, for offering your body to me. And uh, I hope that uh, your spirit is well. And yeah, if I can help your spirit to, to grow on and to move to a nice next incarnation, I would gladly do so. And you give some energy and some attention uh, so that there is a balance. So the chicken sacrificed its body, you sacrifice some of your time, some of your attention to yeah, merely create a balance to keep the system going, to, to level the karma. So this is, yeah, can be called a sacrifice, but it's actually just a duty uh, which you should perform. Um, the real sacrifice is also um, uh, something not so much about maintaining balance, but really about improving the situation. So, for instance, if there's a chicken which you are not going to eat, it is just a chicken somebody else is going to eat, and you have no interest in the chicken's energy, but still you give. This becomes a sacrifice. So you give away something and you get nothing in return. And um, when you start doing this, then you start to move into a different part of the cosmos, into the flow of compassion. And you will yeah, get in contact with other beings which are compassionate. And these can be animals, these can be plants, uh, these can be people, and these can be spirits. And they also sacrifice to you. So in a way, instead of you losing something all the time by sacrificing yourself, others, you will also benefit, benefit from the sacrifice of others. And therefore, you won't die of your sacrifices, but you will be sustained a little bit at least by the sacrifices of others. And the essence of a sacrifice is always that you, in a way, trade something higher for something lower. Um, so, um, for instance, if, I, uh, um, if you look at, for instance, um, somebody in the yeah, like adult entertainment industry. So, um, what they do is like they um, give their love, they give their attention, they give their emotions. Um, so they're sacrificing higher parts of themselves and what do they get instead? Well, they get another person's lust, which is a low vibration, they get some money, which is also a low vibration. So this is also can be seen as a sacrifice. And um, the problem with sacrifices is that if you overdo it, then your vibration will just descend and yeah as happens to people in the adult entertainment industry yeah they end up often yeah turning to drugs or to alcohol or to other horrible things because these lower vibrations become too strong for them and they get pulled down really to these very low levels of, uh, of consciousness um, so it is important to alternate sacrifice by yeah, restoring yourself, by gathering things, so you have something worthwhile to sacrifice. If you sacrifice, 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 then ultimately what you're sacrificing is only very small, very little, because you have so little. So it is good to take the time to recover, to build yourself up, before you make the sacrifice. And the sacrifice also has a very important ritual function, um, because it is, uh, in a way, uh, very much about the devotion. And what do you think something is worth? So um, a famous example is also the, the, the Reiki initiation in the Usui tradition. So uh, Usui had taught a few people in Japan and then this American comes to him and says like I would like to become a Reiki master, I would like to have initiation. And he's like well okay, um, why would I initiate you? 
what are you willing to, to trade? How do you value the initiation? How do you value, value the energy which you would receive? And she basically said, well, I have a house. It is worth $10,000. I will give it to you. So she's sacrificing her home and thereby in a way displaying her appreciation. Her, um, and also it is a kind of a, um, uh, a sign, like I'm, I would prefer not to have a house uh, and to have this energy, so I choose the higher over the lower. And this is also a very important part of sacrifice. It doesn't mean that the amount is important, it's not whether it is $10,000 or not. That is, are you willing to what are you willing to sacrifice? Are you willing to sacrifice your health, your home, your income, your time, uh, your energy? Uh, and a sacrifice is only as worth as much as it is its value to you. If you don't value money, if you have millions and don't care about it, you giving money is not a sacrifice. But if you, yeah, have barely enough to eat, and you share it with somebody else. So you both go a little bit hungry but don't die, this is a sacrifice. And a sacrifice is especially powerful when it pertains to gods. Um, because gods are here to teach us how to um, work with things in the best possible manner. And a sacrifice is a very important part of it. Because we need to find out like how important is something, how important is love, is money, is success, is power. And by sacrifice you can gauge like it is more important than that, but not as important as that. And by making the proper sacrifices, um, it's also responded to by God very strongly. Because it is a signal like, gosh, I really want to work on something, I really want to get something. And the gods are basically the ones who teach us how to get whatever it is we want to get. So, um, if you're talking about sacrifices to, to the Absolute, to the Divine, it is not that useful. It is useful for an internal sense, but not as useful as it is sacrificing to the lower powers, to the gods and goddesses. Um, sacrificing to the Absolute or to angels and saints, um, they often more take the, the, the form of a, of a vow. Um, so saying that I will, for instance, um, leave, leave out certain parts of my life so I can devote myself more to you. So for instance, taking a vow of celibacy or a vow of poverty um, or a vow of obedience. So you're basically saying like, okay, it is more I let go of certain lower vibrations I will, and I would gladly trade them for being guided by you and working in a higher vibration. And lastly, sacrifice can be very important in uh, developing the long will. Uh, the long will is basically uh, developing a desire or uh, a direction in yourself which will last for various incarnations. So really to create stability both in your present life but also through many incarnations so you really can grow to a very high level of competence in a, in a field. And um, the sacrifice of developing a long will often is a, a blood sacrifice. So you're in a way by spilling some of your blood you're basically say, saying like I am de devoting my body or my life force or my life energy to achieving this goal and I would rather die than not achieve this goal and this ensures pretty much that you will have incarnations which will help you to achieve that goal. So you really um, give your life to yeah, that goal which is often in the form of an egregore. Um, so you give your life to the ideals of the egregore or the service of the egregore and gods and goddesses and uh, angels they have very little use for a life uh, or life force in that way but egregores react very strongly to uh, to such rituals um, anything more about sacrifice oh yes the other thing which is really important about sacrifice is that it uh, is basically a safeguard for purity um, as we all know power corrupts because power 
makes it easy to use power as a solution rather than transformation. Uh, for instance, if I um, am poor and I have a problem and I have no power, I have to work on myself not to suffer or to get rid of the problem. If I have a lot of power, well, I can hire somebody to solve the problem or I can drink lots of alcohol and party so I don't experience my problem. And this uh, corruption of power, using power rather than growing, is something which uh, you can also use sacrifice to guard against. Um, because by uh, sacrificing you're basically also saying like what is more important. And by sacrificing you're also in a way give away power, you change your relationship with the power. So for instance, um, if I am able to sacrifice my money, I have a certain amount of money, but I don't know, a master comes along or a saint or an egregore which says like, okay, give me all your money, I'm going to build a nice holy place. And I do that. Then in a way I show that it is safe for me to have money because there is no attachment, and there is no abuse. <laughs> And by, in a way, sacrificing something, you, in a way, paradoxically show that you are capable of dealing with it without danger, without fear. And also in the Tantric path, this is also very important, because Tantric path is about really experiencing things in the most intense way. And this can often lead to entanglements and identification and desire. So often in the tantric path, first you have to be able to live without it, to be able to sacrifice it, to yeah, um, not care about something. And if you're able to totally ignore something, totally control in a way your desires or your attachment to that thing, only then you are ready to truly appreciate it. Without all your attachments, and without your emotions, without your fear, without your projections, without your needs. Um, so sacrifice is very important also to prepare yourself for a next stage in life of really welcoming a deeper, more spiritual relationship with the object you sacrificed. Are there more um, questions about uh, sacrifice or knowledge? Okay, then there are two more questions. Um, could you comment on aphorism of A. Budvodny? One does not choose an egregore, the egregore chooses the person. Um, yes and no. Um, because often what we see is that um, uh, with egregores it is the same as with power animals. They tend to wait until our personality is developed before showing up. Um, and also um, al allowing the incarnated person the freedom again, if it is a light egregore. A uh, dark egregore will basically uh, maintain its claim on the person who once became a part of it in the next life they are expected to serve the egregore again. Uh, if you have a light egregore, they generally uh, let you free, so you can develop in a free way without their influence, neither good or bad, they won't really protect you very much, they won't inspire you very much, you can be your own person until you um, develop your own ideals, and if you choose to rejoin that egregore, they are very happy, if you do not choose to rejoin the egregore, they accept it because they accept the you know, divine law that every yeah you have freedom uh, from all other levels of awareness. So every level of awareness is free from all other influences unless you invite them. And uh, often this invitation is considered to be incorrect if the person has not completely developed themselves yet, because then it is considered in. Uh, a manipulation. So if, for instance, if I'm four years old and an egregore comes and tells me about good and bad and what the purpose of my life is, then I cannot truly develop in freedom and in response to my own spirit because I'm not stable enough, I'm not strong enough yet to 
go against these influences of the egregore and only when you are stable will an egregore or a power animal seek to contact you. So also if a person has uh, psychological instabilities, often people think there are egregores or powers or whatever working with them and these might be dark ones but never light ones because they tend not to work with people who are in such a disturbed or weakened state. Um, what is often also the, uh, the point is that the, um, it is um, in, in a way the, the, the formation of an egregore is usually done by a joining of forces. Um, so often it starts with, uh, uh, with a master who makes contact with angels or saints or gods and um, he gathers some followers and creates a school around it and this starts to, uh, to form an egregore. Um, so an egregore is always in a way a very limited path of, uh, of development and requires a lot of focus, a lot of devotion. And when people were in a more simple life, in a more simple society, often they could devote to just one egregore. But yeah, our society has become so mixed, so confused that uh, yeah, often we have to deal with various egregores or we are actually part of various egregores because we switched ideals or paths in different lives by the circumstances or the cultures which we um, started to incarnate in. And often people are also a part of an egregore without knowing it. Um, so, for instance, a city has an egregore. Uh, 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 the big multinational companies have uh, yeah, minor egregores, uh, or at least spirits watching over them. Uh, countries have egregores. And by just being born in a certain place, you're already in an energetic flow of that egregore. You're already part of um, that family. Uh, but the higher egregores, the more spiritual egregores, uh, they require um, an effort to really transform yourself and or tra try to transform the world. Um, because the essence of, of these egregores is really the process of growth, the process of transformation. And uh, only if you have shown like um, your method of solving problems it's basically what determines what egregore you will be in. And there is no right or wrong, there is just a difference. So if you solve a problem in one way, you become part of one egregore. If you solve a problem in another way, you become part of another egregore. And um, when a person has a large amount of power, so they have a threefold or a fourfold energy body, according to the uh, Toltec tradition described by Castaneda, uh, then these people are considered very powerful tools and then you can actually have egregores kind of competing or fighting who gets to use the tool, who gets to use the person. And um, this can be a very very tricky situation for the person uh, if their own um, yeah uh, if their own personality has not developed well enough then the powers of the egregores which try to use the talents they, it can be overwhelming and a person can be overwhelmed by one or several egregores and then they live a life of service but not because they chose to serve but just because the need for the transformation of the world is so strong that yeah, the person is sacrificed, the incarnation is sacrificed. This can also be done willingly but it can also happen unwillingly to a person. Okay. Um, I see one more question here. Uh, yes, this is an, in comment to uh, a reading I've done for a person who was bothered by a spirit. And the question is, if a person believes that everything is created and ruled by God, including the spirits, egregores and angels. Wouldn't the proper way for her to be to pray to God to take influence of that spirit away? Well, the answer is no. Um, 
because the thing is that if everything is indeed ruled by by God, as is believed both in the, the Vedic tradition as in the Protestant tradition, then everything is yeah, the play of God. And whether you're healthy or sick, whether you're, you're rich or poor, whether you suffer in your life or you enjoy things, all is the will of God. And for you to have another desire to resist what is happening is actually that you try to rebel against the will of God, but also your rebellion against the will of God is also part of the will of God. Uh, but that in a way makes it kind of um, pointless. And here we come to an interesting theological discussion, like is there or is there not free will? And if you go towards the most um, uh, fundamentalist of, of, uh, of teachings, there is no free will, because your will was created by God, and therefore what you desire, what you do, is what God desires and what God does. So if I um, kill a person or rape a person, it is actually God who kills or rapes a person. I have no responsibility in that, because my will, my desire, my actions, they were all created by God. Um, but this also means that, in a way, God is the creator of all, of both light and darkness. So you can't see God as just being only love, only light, but you have to accept that God is the creator of, of all things. Um, and that it is basically God playing with him or herself, and that you are just, in a way, yeah, a part of God, like a puppet in a dollhouse which is being moved and which is being played with for God's amusement in a way. It's all the divine play, the divine game. And if you accept it, you don't suffer as much because you can enjoy in seeing God all around you manifested in all things, even in yourself. Um, it becomes very different if you believe if in duality, if there is like a good God and an, an evil force which is opposing to God or an enemy of God or if there is a separation, like some things are in alignment with God and other things are not. And then you get a very different story. Um, because if you believe that things have a free will, have a free choice, then they can choose to obey God or not to obey God. And the powers which obey God, yeah, if you ask God, like, well, could you please send a saint or an angel or like uh, a lesser deity to help me out? The powers which are yeah, listening to God will respond to that. So part of the cosmos will respond to you, but other parts of the cosmos won't respond to you. And um, I think this is actually, in, at least in my experience, um, yeah, how it goes. That if you have a relationship with powers of a certain cosmos, then, certain, then the powers of that cosmos will respond to you. But powers which belong to a different cosmos won't respond to you. Um, and uh, these cosmoses are also in a way a little bit in, in competition, in what is the best way to grow, how to organize the world. Um, so we tend to have very good control over some aspects of our lives and very poor control over other aspects of our lives. So for instance, um, for me to work with animals or work with, with plants or with oils or with food, this is all very easy because I have a good contact with the nature cosmos. But yeah, for instance, if I have to deal with paperwork and taxes and administration and uh, police and government, this is always turns into a disaster or a mess or whatever. Um, somehow things always go wrong. Why? Because it is another cosmos and even though I have a decent intelligence, I somehow cannot feel it, understand it, grasp it, control it, or these powers are unwilling to help me. And yeah, things go rather difficult. And the same also with yeah, the Lucifer cosmos, which is even yeah, harder for me in, uh, in relationship to it. Um, so you have to in a way, by realizing which cosmos are you attuned to, uh, these are the kind of powers which will help you, which will support you. And the best thing to do is to try to live as much as possible inside your own cosmos. So for me to 
live surrounded by animals would be much easier than to be live surrounded by paperwork. And for other people it is the opposite way. They love living in cities to have the internet and their iPhones and all their tools and gadgets and they love to work with taxes and um, with laws and regulations. This is really their world and yeah, to go out in nature they feel really out of place and afraid and um, yeah, they always get into trouble with, with, uh, with bad food and animals being aggressive towards them. So you really have to know, in a way, find where you belong. And this is the place where you will thrive, where you will be supported, but also the place where you will receive lessons which are good for you. Because from these other cosmoses you also really receive blockages. But they tend to be yeah, blockages which are not really helping you to grow spiritually. There are more disruptions and distractions. And yeah, here when it comes to um, um, to a spirit, the uh, most likely thing is usually that the spirit actually belongs to the same cosmos. Because things tend to stay within the same cosmos, whether they're fighting you or not fighting you, because light and dark belong to all cosmoses. So for instance there is a light side to nature but there is also a terrible, destructive, uncaring side to nature um, which can easily crush you and not give a damn. And um, often you find that your opponents can be from another cosmos and then they are really difficult because you have very little skill but most of your challenges will actually come from the same cosmos. Um, so in her case uh, yeah, it would be good to look a little bit like, okay, what are the normal powers which surround me? Ask them to help or to give awareness or to help see what this other spirit is doing. But you also have to realize that only, uh, yeah, like the light side of that cosmos can help you against the dark side of the cosmos. But the light side of that cosmos can't help you against the dark side of another cosmos. So, for instance, if I ask my cat to help me with my taxes, that won't help. Because my ta cat might be very willing to help me, it might love me a lot, and be very motivated, but it just can't solve my problem. <laughs> and yeah, if you have an ally in, in, in that cosmos, that's a lot more useful. So if I would find a friend who's good at bookkeeping, well, that he can do a lot more for me. <laughs> And sometimes it is you can make a trade with an, with a power which is from a, another cosmos. So, like for instance, he is really in, in, into into bookkeeping and the contracts. So, if I make a contract with him, I will pay you a hundred euros, or I will pay you a percentage for all the money you save on taxes. And make a contract with him, I go into his cosmos, make a contract, make up some rules. So I go a little bit into his cosmos to get him to help me. And then he fulfills his contract, he fulfills his deal, and he takes care. He makes that problem go away. And this is also why it is very useful, in a way, um, in a school, um, to have people from all different cosmoses, and to have people also from all different yeah, levels of skill, so that the school itself is very safe, is very stable. So if you build a school which only has to do with nature, well, it will die because of problems with taxes, maybe. And also if you build a school which is based totally on contracts and laws and things like this, well, then people might get sick or food might spoil and people get food poisoning or other disturbances can ruin and destroy a school. But a true, really, yeah, religion um, will actually encompass all elements uh, and of course there's a certain leading element but the other elements need to be there to stabilize it in the, in the physical world, in our physical uh, manifestation. And in her case also to um, yeah, have this uh, yeah, obstacle removed, she would also need to do the same thing in miniature. Just like a school needs a little bit of all the other elements, she also needs a little bit of all the other elements just to stabilize herself. Okay. Yes. Um, yes. Uh, I wanted to say um, uh, one more thing. 
um, and this is indeed about um, also activity um, because some religions basically they, they um, or philosophies they favor inactivity they basically say like well everything is God will if something is supposed to happen it will happen if I should join an egregore uh, I should yeah, it will happen um, but um, it helps in a certain way to have non-attachment and this is the benefit of this of, and to have humility, to have surrender um, but um, there is a difference between the path of the hero and the path of the monk uh, the path of the hero is basically that you see yourself as a power, as a creator who has an own will and can create something, can manifest something and make it yours by working on it and it generally is, there is a balance, so the amount of energy you put out is the amount of growth you get back. So it is very certain, very safe in a way. Um, maybe you're growing in a, in a way which is not very good for you, or by focusing too much your vibration becomes too low. So there are dangers, of course, on every path, but there's always an, a balance there. If you take a different path, it, this is the path of the monk, this is the path of... Uh, the heart of surrender, of uh, mysticism, where you basically try to surrender yourself and to allow yourself to become part of something bigger. Um, and this has a balance between passive and active. So, in a way, to become part of something bigger and to have this surrender, you need to be passive. But once there is this contact, so you do make this contact with the egregore or with the Holy Spirit, then often you uh, you are tasked to to work on yourself, to grow on yourself, to purify yourself, so you can continue. But there you, in a way, have these alternations of surrender and being active, surrender and being active. There's never a path where you're only passive and only in surrender. Uh, this is usually a rather dark path. So, for instance, one of the things which are typical for uh, for dark masters is to say like, oh, you should do everything I say and I will transform your karma and you will never have to reincarnate again. Um, so this is very typical. So you don't develop yourself and even if he would keep his word, he would keep his part of the bargain and take away all your karma and you would rise to a very high level of awareness because you are not ready, you are not stable, you're, you will quickly become impure and attached again and go back to being reincarnated. So you can't really maintain something without working on it. And this is also the, the trick with, uh, with black magic. Uh, black magic allows you to take powers and talents and energies from lots of other sources. So they can boost you. But if you don't stabilize yourself on this new level of power, this new level of awareness and really grow into it, you will lose it again. And with Black like magic you can be very powerful even for several incarnations but ultimately because you are in unstable, immature, it won't hold. Um, okay. So, oh my god, we've talked for quite a while now. So, um, yeah, I wanted to, to bring up one, one uh, subject. Uh, because I basically started this uh, series of, of lessons as um, uh, because Sigurd wanted to have some more explanation for some workshops and uh, Nienke had been asking me for more than a year to help her to grow a little bit more and she lives very far away from me uh, so I thought this will be a nice way to get in contact with them and to, to help them a bit but uh, Sigurd has no time and Nienke also cannot join because she has other classes on Wednesdays. Uh, so I'm wondering a little bit what is the best way to continue this. Um, because I like teaching, but I also like my teachings to reach as many people as possible. So I was also very happy with the idea of uh, Sigurd of typing some things out and maybe yeah, discussing them in discussion groups or spreading them. So if like my lessons and my knowledge is spread, or if I can maybe uh, record it and put it on YouTube, uh, this will be very useful uh, to yeah, really fulfill a little bit my own purpose, my own mission. 
Um, the other thing is that um, at present, like I'm a bit challenged financially, um, so I feel also a little bit that stress. Like, oh, I could use this time to maybe try to yeah make some money or to work or to to do other things. Um, so I don't know if there are people who really don't know what to do with their money, but if yeah people are interested in making a donation, it's also easy for me to yeah continue with these teachings with yeah a bit less stress or having to choose. Um, ultimately, of course, I should ask for guidance, but I have not had the time to do this yet. But I will go on a seminar and I will ask for some guidance then, and maybe you have some nice inspirations or suggestions. And uh, yeah, we can have a look at it or email about it a little bit uh, before the next class. Okay. Well, thank you very much for uh, your questions. And they're very beautiful questions, very inspiring, and I loved sharing this with you. Okay.